Each year in the United States, thousands of major crimes go unsolved. When the case has gone cold and police have nowhere to turn, they seek assistance from the public. This is a program dedicated to solving these cases. This is Crime Stoppers Case Files. Good evening and thank you for joining us for another Northeast Ohio edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files. I'm Bob France. There are over 1,400 Crime Stoppers organizations operating around the world. These organizations empower citizens like you to become directly and anonymously involved in fighting crime in our communities. We see the positive impact of this every day in Northeast Ohio as Crime Stoppers has become an important law enforcement tool, a proactive approach to removing dangerous criminals from the streets and making them safer for everyone. Each week on this television program, we'll share facts with you from unsolved cases, and you'll have the opportunity to submit information that may help investigators, possibly earning yourself a cash reward without ever having to give your name. Let's get to work. Miguel Campbell lived on the east side of Cleveland near 93rd and Miles Avenue. One night while returning home from his job at a nightclub, he was chased through the streets and gunned down in an apparent robbery. Here's the story. Miguel was a nice, sweet little boy when he was growing. He came here when he was 10 years old. It was seven of them, and um, their father passed away. I raised them by myself. You know, I bring them here when they was 10, and I raised them here. I worked three, four, five jobs. Some jobs I worked eight years, some seven years. Now I'm you know, still working to take care of my kids and my fam rest of family. And I know Miguel was a hardworking person, very much hard worker. So I think he worked down the flat someplace. He used to make bottles, plastic bottles, you know, work in a factory down there. And he worked in the bank sometimes. He do cleaning up the bank. And um, he do his music. He loved music. He works as a DJ in the clubs. And his children, they growing up, he had a, a son which want to go in music just as his father. My son was a loving person, very much loving. And everybody loved my son, especially the young people who, um, when he orchestrated the music, they're always there for my son. And I love my son, and he was very good to me, and he always there for me if I need him. You're always there. I need, I need an ambulance. Somebody just got shot on 93rd and Miles. 93rd and Miles? Yeah, 93rd and Miles. He ain't breathing. He ain't moving. He ain't breathing or moving? He ain't breathing or moving. I think he's taking his last breath. Okay, we're going to get a car up there. This murder occurred on September 2nd, 2008, in the early morning hours, approximately 3.40 in the morning. As Miguel Campbell was coming home from his job, he had worked that night at Daly's Restaurant and Bar. And after completing his shift, he drove home. His wife heard him pull into the driveway and almost immediately she heard a shot ring out. When she looked out the window, she could see the interior light was on in his truck, but he was nowhere to be seen. Uh, we learned later that three to four black males approached Mr. Campbell. Uh, one of them shot at him or shot him initially in the leg. And there's video showing him running past the convenience store at East 93rd and Miles Avenue. Uh, when he ran into the intersection at that location, he ran up to a car, asked the driver to let him in, which he didn't. Uh, and said that a male who was chasing him was shooting at him. Just as he said that to the driver, the shooter ran up, gun in hand, and shot Mr. Campbell. And the witness states that as he was driving away, he looked in his rearview mirror and saw the suspect stand up over Mr. Campbell and shoot him twice more. Apparently, after Mr. Campbell was shot, the suspect went through his pockets. His pockets were pulled inside out and there, his cell phone was, was laying in the street along with other papers that he had 
in his pocket prior to his death. The suspect then fled back north on East 93rd to the front of Mr. Campbell's house where he joined the rest of the males and they fled through the yard at Mr. Campbell's home. But they, you know, they killed my son in, in cold blooded like that. He was right in his house to go, to open his door, to go in his house and they cut him down just like that um, in cold blooded. We'll be right back with more on the murder of Miguel Campbell right after this. In 1975, the first Crime Stoppers organization was formed by a detective who believed media attention helped solve cases. Since then, thousands of Crime Stoppers organizations have been formed around the globe with the same mission, encouraging members of the public to stand up against crime. Every 14 minutes, Crime Stoppers help solve a crime somewhere in the world. Get involved. Contact your Crime Stoppers organization and learn how you can help. Leave a tip, crimestoppers1.com. The casings that were found on the scene were nine millimeters. Uh, there were several and they were by the curb line. they have been kicked around probably before we arrived because of the traffic flow. So that would lead us to believe that a nine millimeter weapon was used to murder Mr. Campbell. Uh, the witness, couldn't really see the weapon. Uh, he did believe it was a semi-automatic, but he could not be sure. And as he was driving away, again, he saw the male stand above him and fire twice. Mr. Campbell was shot in the leg and multiple times in the body and in the back. And he succumbed to his injuries on the scene. The witness describes the first male as dark skin, slim, wearing a lumberjack style jacket. And the second male was approximately five foot nine inches, light skin with a bushy ponytail, wearing blue jean shorts and a red shirt. Uh, after being joined by two other males who the witness could not describe, they fled through the rear yard of Mr. Campbell's home. You know, anybody know what happened, please go to the police and let us know because I can't get over my son's death because it, it's hard to live without your children or your child and don't know what happened. We're seeking anybody who might have information in this case. We would like to solve this case and give his family some peace. Uh, anybody with information can contact myself, Detective Wally Everett at the Cleveland Police Department Homicide Unit or my partner, Detective Michael Smith at the same location. The number there is 216-623-5464, or you can call the number for Crime Stoppers. This young man worked multiple jobs just to provide a good life for his family. He should have been able to walk into his home peacefully after a hard night's work. But these thugs had other ideas. And if you know anything about this horrible crime, we need you to call Crime Stoppers. You will not have to give your name, and you can earn thousands of dollars in cash just for doing the right thing. We'll be right back with more when we return to Crime Stoppers Case Files. Welcome back to Crime Stoppers Case Files. We need your help in solving a brutal homicide in the city of Cleveland. Jason Henderson did everything right. He built a nice career for himself. He stayed off the streets, surrounded himself with family and friends. But none of that mattered when a thug decided to end his life simply because he wanted to steal his car. This is the case of the murder of Jason Henderson, a case you can help solve. Yeah, my son, Jason Henderson, he was a fine young man. Made me very proud to be his father. I tell you, he lost his mom in 2000, but he rebounded really well, even losing his mom to asthma. But he was an athletic kid in school. Basketball was his favorite. He wasn't the best, but he thought he was. Oh yeah, my brother, if I could describe him, he's a superstar. Class act, man. He's the one everybody in the family kind of gravitated. He had that type of personality. Everybody just gravitated to him. Jason was a very charismatic guy. I mean, he was a very flashy guy. You know, he's well-dressed, well-spoken, you know, well-mannered. He loved life. Loved everything about life. There's nothing 
he wouldn't do for me if I asked him to. He'd walk into a room and light the room up. And uh, he's just a happy guy. You know, he had a very distinctive laugh that it was kind of obnoxious, but you knew it was him when you heard that laugh. And that's why I, I probably remember the smile and the laugh most about him. Jason was the kind that people fell in love with easy. And he had a lot of friends out there. Then he had some people that probably was jealous of him because of the um, lifestyle, materialistic things he went out and purchased from working to get. Uh, he started out after high school, he started out as a uh, bill collector for the Illuminated Company, worked his way up, became a meter reader, door to door, worked his way up from there, started, went to Lakeland College to get a social degree so he can become a lineman. So, you know, people, young people use the phrase haters. Probably some haters out there, jealousy, envy. But he was a hardworking guy. He didn't fall out of heaven, he wasn't perfect, but he was a Christian. He believed in Almighty God. And I just, I lost him, but I still hope we can find some closure to this case. 911, do you need police fire in? Yes, I do. On December 27, 2008, Jason Henderson and a longtime childhood friend got together and went to Jason's father's house at 887. East 131st Street in the city of Cleveland. They went over there and was watching a boxing match that was occurring that night with his father. After the boxing was over, Jason and his childhood friend went to a couple clubs downtown Cleveland to socialize. They returned to his father's house about 2 a.m. on December 28th, at which time they were planning on going their own ways and going home. Um, they sat on his father's front porch. At this point, the suspect in this case came from the back of Mr. Henderson's house, came along the south side of the house to the front corner of the residence, and without a word being said, pointed a handgun at the back of Jason Henderson's head, pulled the trigger, shooting him in the back left side of his head. After I saw the shooter shoot Jason, the, the shooter just, uh, he told me to, to, to lay it down. Uh, he was wearing a red hoodie with, with a maybe white scarf or cloth. The suspect then proceeded to go through his friend's pockets, taking the friend's car keys, some currency, and believed that these keys were actually to Jason Henderson's 2005 a uh, red magnum that was parked in the driveway. The suspect then went into the driver's area of the vehicle. And at this point, Mr. Henderson, who was inside the residence, uh, was awakened. Morning, I heard a noise on my front, front of my house and I was sleeping in my living room on the couch. And I went to the door and I didn't see anyone. And I opened my door and when I walked out on the porch, I seen a young man on the sidewalk and he shouted, hey, somebody's on the porch. And then I see another young man run across my lawn with a red hoodie on, and they took off. And when I walked to the screen door, I seen my son Jason laying there on the top step in a puddle of blood, and I seen his best friend laying on the bottom concrete, not moving, neither one of them. And I got to the phone, called 911, and the operator's dispatch said, start CPR on him. And so we started CPR on him. We had to roll him over on his back. Police came, the ambulance came, and, uh, but he was pronounced. Yeah, he was gone then. Crime Stoppers is an international organization dedicated to bringing resolution to unsolved crimes. Members of the public work with police to make the world a safer place. Since 1975, thousands of Crime Stoppers organizations worldwide have helped make over one million arrests. 
Crime Stoppers acts as your advocate, keeping you anonymous and ensuring that your information gets to the right law enforcement agency. To leave a tip, log on to www.crimestoppers1.com. Well, that night I got off work about one o'clock in the morning, got home, got cleaned up, the phone call of my life around maybe something after two. My father called me and said, hey man, you killed your brother on the steps. I said, he said, my other brother's in the hospital fighting for his life. His friend tells me, he honestly believed by me coming on that porch, that's why the guy didn't kill him also. I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, they would have shot me too. I would have got shot as well. The night before it happened, I was admitted in the hospital. Uh, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I was having problems with my asthma, uh, shortness of breath, and things like that. And uh, you know, my, my brother, my brother, and my dad came in. I thought it's like a usual visit. How they usually come and see me when I'm in the hospital. But you know, they were looking a little down, more down than usual. You know, that's when my brother Tobias he talked to my dad. He said, "Did you want to tell him?" And I was saying, "Like, tell me what?" And that's when they told me that my brother was killed. And uh, it was, it was real tough news. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It was um, kind of affecting my, my breathing even more because, you know, you just, I was just crying so much and just breathing so hard. And my family was just trying to keep me together so I wouldn't, you know, get worse in a worse condition than I already was. Oh, this is just so painful. You know, it's like uh, someone put a dagger in my heart. Best way I can describe it is helplessness. Cry many nights, some days you have good days, some days you have bad. My minister told me, said, no parent should have to bury their child. And if you know something, just make a phone call. You don't have to give a name, a number, just make a phone call if you know anything. I don't believe my brother, he deserved that. He's been robbed a couple times, and every time he gave it up. But this right here is just cold hearted. Here we have a victim that was making the right choices in his life. He had progressed at work and became a lineman and was, again, not doing anything illegal or was involved in activity that should put him in harm's way. And for somebody just to come up out of nowhere without anything being said and to gun him down in the back of the head and execute him, and having his father come out to find him with this wound and his mind racing, not knowing what just happened, what he should do, and having his own son, who I'm sure he was proud and loved, greatly die in his arms. Terrible. And my son would have gave up anything he had. If you put a gun on him, he would have gave it to you. But he's that kind of person. Here, you can have it. I can get some more. I'm a working man, but if you know anything about this case and you can help solve it, please help the family, help the family get some closure here. Because one day, who knows, maybe your son, your daughter. The suspect is described as being a black male with medium to light complexion. He's about 5'9", medium build, and at the time of the crime, he was wearing an orange or red hooded sweatshirt and also had a some type of white cloth across the lower part of his face. Please help the family of Jason Henderson. Help bring them some closure after this brutal crime. If you know anything about the thugs responsible for this, pick up the phone and call 216-25-CRIME or go to the web and give your tip at 25crime.com. Remember, you don't give your name and you could earn a cash reward for information leading to the capture of these criminals. Remember, as Avery Henderson said, no parent should ever have to bury their child. Please help. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files, where you are empowered to help clean up the streets. Remember, our towns and our neighborhoods are a direct reflection of what we allow them to be. So let's all do our part to make them safe. And we'll see you next time for another edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files.